Chapter 9 Derek grabbed the ringing cell phone and put it to his ear as he typed furiously on his laptop. Derek Kramer. Derek, is that really you? A female voice came over the line. Derek abruptly stopped typing, grabbing the phone firmly. Jenny? Hi, Jenny said in relief. I have been trying to get a hold of you for weeks now. Wow, we haven't talked in ages. Derek leaned back in his chair. What's going on? She gave a sad laugh. That's the thing. I've got bad news. Your dad has a parole hearing tomorrow. What? The word was dragged leaden out of him. All his pleasure at hearing from Jenny evaporated, replaced by a dull weight that made it hard to breathe. Yeah, apparently he applied for parole. She had a bitter laugh. I'm trying to find anyone to testify against him at the hearing so that he stays in jail where he belongs. I thought he wasn't supposed to be able to get out, Derek said woodenly. Overcrowding and good behavior, Jenny growled. So far, the only one doing anything about it is me. I'm trying to find more of us, but most just aren't functioning adults. Mary's in rehab again. So's Johnny. Dave overdosed a few years ago. I can't find Nate or Georgie or any of the others. I'm amazed I finally tracked you down. It was hard since you changed your last name. He swallowed thickly. So, it's just you and me to testify. Actually, it's just you. Jenny sounded apologetic. I was in a car crash and I'm still recovering. I'm not cleared to fly, so I can't make it out. Me. Alone. At his hearing. Derek closed his eyes and rubbed his forehead. I'm so sorry to put this all on you, Derek, but you know what he did. You know that we can't let him out of jail, Jenny persisted. I signed an affidavit. I think that's what it's called. It'll be read at the hearing, but someone else needs to stand up and testify, to hold the parole board to account. Please say you'll do it. Tomorrow, Derek muttered. He tried to ignore the dark hole that was the memories from his childhood. At one in the afternoon, she confirmed. Promise me, Derek, that you'll go. You always kept your promises. Tell me you turned out okay, Derek asked, trying to deflect her, that you aren't like how most of us turned out. I'm a mom. I have two beautiful girls and a great husband, she sniffed a little. I take a lot of antidepressants and still go to therapy. How about you? Derek had a bitter laugh. I just work until I'm too tired to have nightmares. I stopped therapy a few years ago. There just wasn't time. No substance abuse? No medications? She questioned. No, he assured her. That's good. Jenny sounded a little wistful. I'm glad. We're lucky. We're lucky that we had Louisa as a foster mom, Derek replied shortly. Without her, I would be right alongside Johnny, Dave, and Mary. Maybe, Jenny allowed. She waited for a moment before asking again. Are you going to go? Promise me you'll go and stop him from doing this to someone else. Derek put his head in his hands. He tried to ignore the sinking turmoil in his stomach. All the antacids in the world wouldn't fix this. He set the phone back to his ear. Tomorrow at one. Yes. Okay, I promise. Jenny had thanked him. Derek had finally gotten off the phone with any promises to keep in touch. Neither of them wanted reminders of the past. He'd spent the next hour in the washroom watching his just-eaten lunch go down the toilet. Stomach empty, he popped a mint and decided to talk to Cynthia. He would need to get the time off. Not that he wouldn't skip work if necessary. He'd given his word that he would go. But it would be easier if she just approved him to get away for the hearing. Which meant he was going to have to tell her why. That was something he was not looking forward to doing. Derek knocked on the doorframe of Cynthia's office. He waited for her to look up from her work before shutting the door behind him and taking a seat. "'You look like death warmed over,' she observed. For a moment he toyed with the idea of playing the sick card, but knew that wouldn't evoke an ounce of sympathy from her. Unless he had a terminal disease, she'd expect him to work. It was the sort of relationship they had which had worked so well throughout the past eight years.' Derek fiddled with his phone, turning it over and over in his hands. I need an afternoon off. When? Cynthia inquired. Tomorrow. 
No way. She shook her head. We have interviews tomorrow with Mr. Clover. He says he has evidence of Mrs. Clover's infidelities, which would go a long way in court to help us. I need you there. I can't. Derek looked at her in the eye. I need to be at a parole board meeting. A what? Cynthia looked up from her paperwork and gave him her full attention. Did I just hear you right? My dad has a parole board hearing, Derek admitted. His fingers continued to play with the phone, turning it over and over just to have something to do to expend his nervous energy. I need to be there. So that you can help him make parole? Cynthia studied him. I admit, I never would have thought if one of your parents was in jail. They both are. Prison, actually, Derek clarified, and I'd much rather he stayed there. I plan on testifying against him. Oh, Cynthia was a little shocked. After learning he had been in foster care, she'd asked some of her social worker contacts about his information. No one had gotten back to her just yet. Derek was such a well-functioning adult that she would never have thought he would have two parents in jail. I have to go do this, Derek said calmly, despite the swirl of emotions that were inside of him. I can't be here tomorrow afternoon. Okay, she found herself agreeing. Now she was more curious than ever about his past. Leave at noon, or whenever you need to go, and come back the next morning. You're sure? I can have the evening off as well? He wanted to make sure she understood. You won't be calling me in with some emergency or questions about a case? I'll be fine, Cynthia shrugged, unless you want to help me sew up a costume for Sarah's play. Derek froze. You? Sewing? It'll be fine, she mustered up some confidence. I'll watch a few YouTube videos, grab some fabric and thread. Then create a masterpiece for the kid to wear on Thursday. This Thursday? Derek asked in disbelief. He ran a hand over his face. Do you even have a sewing machine? Like, have you ever sewn anything in your life? It's just a costume, Cynthia frowned at him. It's not rocket science. I'm sure it'll be fine. When you run your finger through the needle, don't forget to cut the threads before you hit the hospital, Derek advised as he got up from the chair. What sort of costume? A duck. It's the old MacDonald had a farm play or something like that. Cynthia waved a hand dismissively. I wasn't really listening. It may have been Red Riding Hood, but I don't recall a chicken being involved in that story. You are so screwed. Derek couldn't help a small smile from creeping across his lips. You should have a little faith in me, she protested defensively. Derek shook his head. Nope, not after the burnt sacrifice. Hey, that wasn't my fault, Cynthia glared at him. How was I supposed to know to put water in with the noodles? Maybe if you'd read the instructions that mac and cheese so thoughtfully provided on the box, he smirked. Get back to work, Cynthia demanded. I need as much done on the clover case as possible before you leave. Yes, boss. Derek shot her sloppy salute and left the office. Cynthia leaned back in her chair and was thankful that she'd already lined up a seamstress and given her instructions. All she had to do was take Sarah for a fitting and then somehow bribe the little girl not to disclose the facts of who really made the costume to him. Taking a ribbing from Derek had been worth getting a look of determined terror off his face for the parole board hearing. Now she was even more curious as to what had happened in his life. Picking up her phone, she dialed a case manager that owed her a favor. Delinda, Cynthia greeted the woman. Did you happen to get any information on Derek Kramer yet? Cynthia, direct as always, Jolinda greeted her. It wasn't easy since he changed his name, but after some digging, I got it. He changed his name? Cynthia frowned. What was it before? Google the Auckland child prostitution case from 21 years ago, she advised. It'll be quicker than my putting together the file. The Aucklands and three other sick people were running a ring of about 12 or so kids. Derek Auckland was 10 when the feds broke it up, putting his parents in jail. Being their kid didn't save him, he was just as bad off as the others. Like feral cats, these kids. No schooling. They pass from foster home to foster home, most of them running away or turning to drugs. Don't know where they all are now. Why do you want to know? It's a case I'm looking into, Cynthia lied. She felt sick. Well, if any of your clients are linked to this, you could probably put them before a judge as being unfit parenting material. They lived half their childhoods in a hostile environment. I doubt a single one of them would function well as an adult. Jolinda sighed. It's a sad world we live in. Are you sure there isn't a mistake? That you've got the right Derek Kramer? She asked. 
Yep, Jolinda was confident. At age 20, Derek took on the name of one of his foster mothers, an old lady named Louisa Kramer. She had him the longest, from age 15 through 17, according to the records. What happened? Or was he from age 17 to 18? questioned Cynthia. She died. Had a stroke, and that was it. He lived in four more foster homes that year and then graduated out of the system. No other notes on what happened to him, Jolinda replied. Did you need anything else? No, that's it. Thanks. Cynthia hung up the phone and felt extremely perturbed. She googled the incident and was sickened by what she found on the internet. Turning off her browser, Cynthia got up and stared out the window. How dare they? How dare his own parents do that to a little boy? Cynthia felt outraged. It would be like someone hurting her nieces and nephews. How dare Jolinda malign Derek saying he wouldn't be a good father? He was excellent with the kids, better than Cynthia was. He practically deserved a Dad of the Year award just for cooking and helping with all the issues her new little family was going through. He was funny, he was helpful, he was gentle, he was incredibly smart, he worked tirelessly for her, he put up with her, and he took over Missy's duties. Derek was also good to look at, Cynthia reflected ruefully. She respected him. She liked him. She might even be falling for him. Where had that come from? Cynthia supposed after eight years of working nearly every single waking moment together, they were bound to respect and like each other. However, she was thinking of liking in more than just a professional relationship, more than just a friendship, even. She didn't have many friends. A month ago, she wouldn't even have considered Derek a friend. Then again, a month ago, he hadn't been using peanut butter to get gum out of her hair, or offering advice on what to do with the kids, or laughing at her when she asked him how to shut off a smoke detector, thinking she could feed five kids with five boxes of mac and cheese burning in a microwave. Cynthia felt a little flutter. A month ago, they weren't kissing in the mudroom or the elevator. He was an excellent kisser. She wanted to repeat the experience. Cynthia wanted to create a lot of experiences with Derek. Everything from simple dating and hand-holding to full-out making him hers. Twenty-one years ago, he'd been ten. That made him thirty-one. He was eleven years younger than her. It was a large age gap. Then again, men had been dating women younger than them for centuries. Why couldn't a woman date a younger guy? Cynthia turned the thought over in her mind. Did she want to date Derek? Could she see herself with him, short or long term? She really liked him. Cynthia tried not to smile at the thought. He obviously found her attractive, otherwise he never would have kissed her. Was she willing to complicate her work life in the quest to make her personal life happier? It wasn't like she was going to get senior partner any time soon. Maybe she could just relax a little bit. She had five kids to think of now. That meant she was bound to lower her workload since the kids would require a lot of her time. It also meant that maybe she'd take some time for dating. She wondered what Derek would think about that. Where's Derek? Sarah asked as she scribbled on her homework. He's busy tonight. Cynthia said as she rinsed off some glasses and put them in the dishwasher. She looked at the machine. Where did one put the soap? Doing what? The little girl doodled on her paper. She was supposed to be copying words. Instead, she made pretty flowers. Not sure, Cynthia shrugged. She grabbed the liquid dish soap and poured a generous amount on the inside of the dishwasher door, then shut it firmly. She squinted at all the buttons. You need a degree in engineering to run this thing. Do you want me to turn it on? Sarah asked as she grabbed a green marker. I've seen Derek do it lots. I know how. Let me give this a try. Cynthia punched a button and the machine started. Yes. See, that wasn't hard. Sarah kept making flowers. Cynthia looked around the kitchen and living room. Sean was playing with his Legos, but otherwise the space was clean. Serenity was safe in her playpen, gnawing on a toy. Simon and Serena were doing homework in their rooms. She had the hang of this, Cynthia thought proudly. All she had to do was pop in a casserole from the church ladies and the evening would be set. What's for supper? Sarah questioned. Casserole, Cynthia replied. She went to the freezer and picked two out at random. That way, if they didn't like one, they could eat the other. Those were the simple choices tonight. 
She shoved them into the stove and read the instructions Derek had posted on the fridge for her to follow. She stared at the stove. It had a lot of buttons on it. Ten minutes of YouTube videos, Cynthia set the timer and the temperature. She could do this mom thing. She checked on Simon and Serena just to verify they were actually doing their homework, then returned to the kitchen to hear Sarah giggling hysterically. What is going on? Cynthia stopped and stared in shock. The dishwasher was spewing out a gigantic mass of shiny bubbles, as tall as the six-year-old who was playing in them. Sarah shrieked with laughter, throwing a large fluff of bubble suds into the air. Isn't it awesome? Awesome! Sean yelled as he stomped out of the cloud of bubbles, suds clinging all over him. Oh boy, Cynthia blinked. She quickly pressed all sorts of buttons on the machine, desperately hoping to get it to stop. How does this thing work? The doorbell rang. I'll get it! Sarah screeched and lunged for the door, but Cynthia managed to get a hand on the girl's collar. No, Cynthia responded. You will get Serena to help clean up the bubbles. I will get the door. Sarah pouted as Cynthia left the kitchen to answer the door. Ms. Stone? Mr. Davidson, their caseworker, stood on the threshold. I hope this is a good time. Cynthia tried to wipe a stray hair out of her face. She stopped as she saw her hand was covered in bubbles. She quickly put it behind her back and smiled. Mr. Davidson, what a surprise! He smiled back. I imagine it is. That's how surprise visits go. They are a surprise. Why don't you come in? Cynthia stepped back to allow the man to enter. He looked around the foyer. Should I take off my shoes? Please leave them on. Cynthia decided she might as well come clean. He was going to see the kitchen anyways. We've had a bit of an issue with the dishwasher. Oh? She led the way to the kitchen. Thankfully, Sarah had obeyed and gotten her sister. Now the three children were capturing bubbles with towels while Simon mopped the floor. How much soap did you put in there? Simon pushed his glasses up. Cynthia sighed. Too much. Mr. Davidson's mouth twitched. You did this? It was my first time running the dishwasher, Cynthia admitted a little sheepishly. I'm learning. I don't think you should run the dishwasher anymore, Sarah wrinkled her nose, even if it was fun to play in all the bubbles. If I don't try, then how will I learn to do it properly? Cynthia asked the little girl. Maybe one of us could teach you? Sarah replied. Do any of you know how to run the dishwasher? Cynthia questioned. I know you've learned how to do the laundry. The instructions for heating casseroles on the fridge. We've all figured out how to clean up after ourselves, yet I'm not sure anyone knows how to run the dishwasher. I know how to load it, Simon volunteered. I told you, Sarah said matter-of-fact with her little voice. I watched Derek do it lots. You have to put in one of the pods in, then shut the door and press the orange button. It's easy. A pod? Cynthia frowned. Sarah opened a cupboard door and showed the container of dishwashing detergent. One of these, just one. Oh, Cynthia felt a little silly. Who would have thought that dish soap wasn't for a dishwasher? Mr. Davidson cleared his throat. While you children are helping your aunt to clean this up, why don't I talk with each of you in turn and you can show me your pets and rooms? Who wants to go first? He had a brief five-minute private conversation with each child, inspected the house, petted the cats and dogs. By the time he was done, the kitchen was clean and the dishes were rinsed off. Cynthia would run them through the dishwasher again, without soap. Miss Stone, did Mr. Davidson smiled happily, I'm pleased to say that everything looks good. The children appear to be adjusting nicely. Cynthia breathed a sigh of relief. She smiled. She didn't know why she had felt so nervous. Thank you. It's been new to all of us, but I'm enjoying taking care of them. Keep up the good work. I expect I'll have one or two more visits, then I'll be able to sign off on your case, Mr. Davidson replied. Cynthia saw the caseworker out and leaned against the door. What did he say? Serena and the kids were gathered, watching her. Cynthia smiled at them. We're all good. Derek laid on his bed, pressing the heels of his hands into his eyes as he tried to process the entire afternoon. What a waste. A waste of time, a waste of money, a waste of the justice system in general. Certain people who had done certain crimes 
just shouldn't be allowed out, in Derek's opinion. He wasn't a fan of the death penalty, but he was a definite fan of life imprisonment if the crime was big enough. Derek sighed. He was probably not going to sleep tonight, or end up having nightmares. He debated briefly using some sleep medications, but decided against it. He didn't want to become addicted to anything, use anything as a crutch. Besides, it wouldn't be good to be sleepy when Cynthia called him with another two-in-the-morning emergency. His dad had aged. Or maybe it was that Derek's memories were fuzzy. He hadn't seen Auckland since he'd testified at the age of twelve against him and his mother during court cases. Derek hadn't wanted to see them ever again. His father had testified that he was a changed man, that he was ready to return to society, that he would never harm another soul. Derek didn't believe Auckland for a second. However, he couldn't really count himself as objective, nor did he know the man well enough to discern his actual intentions. He did know who his father had been, and Derek had told the judge exactly that. He was the man who had ruined the lives of at least sixteen children, maybe more. He was a man who had no conscience. He was the man who haunted Derek's nightmares when he had them. Auckland didn't deserve to be free. Derek wasn't sure why he called that man his father. He wasn't, really. Auckland may have given him the DNA that produced Derek, but truth was neither his dad nor his mom had been real parents. They just created him. Real parents cared about their kids. Real parents helped their kids, protected them, worried about them. Derek thought about Jenny's letter, read by a court-appointed lawyer to argue against Auckland. It had been a moving testimony of a woman who had deep, lasting issues from the childhood trauma subjected to her from Auckland. When they were graduating from the foster care system together, Derek and Jenny had been mutually attracted to one another. Derek had always wondered what might have been. Now he knew. Jenny, though she liked him, would never have been with Derek because the memories he stirred up from their past. The fact that he was Auckland's son, that he'd shared her shame— had made her turn down any idea of a relationship with him. At the time, he'd been confused. Now he understood. It was for the best, anyways. The two of them in a relationship, neither of them understanding how to be around a normal person, would likely have ended up in disaster. Jenny was far better off with her husband and two kids. Today had been horrendous, and he was glad not to have to talk to anyone or do anything for the rest of the evening. The good news was that the parole had been denied. The bad news was that Auckland was eligible to repeal. Derek would likely have to continue to testify over and over in hopes of keeping the man in jail. He would keep his promise to Jenny, to do what he could to make sure Auckland wasn't released. Derek sighed and looked up at the ceiling. It wasn't doing him any good to stay here for the evening with nothing to do. He could try to get some work done which he didn't feel like doing, or he could find out what roommate number two's name really was. It wasn't particularly appealing, however, the fridge was calling. There had to be something edible in this apartment. Derek slowly pulled himself up from the bed. He hadn't eaten properly since learning the parole hearing was happening. Now he was starving. In the kitchen, roommate number one, Duane, was pulling a bottle of soda out of the fridge he blinked in Derek at surprise. I've heard the rumors that a third person lived in this apartment, but until this moment I hadn't thought them to be true. Very funny. Derek looked through the cupboards. Wait. Duane cocked his head to the side. Do you pay for groceries? Considering there aren't any groceries here? Derek shrugged after a quick peek inside the fridge. I don't think you need to be worried about that. Duane gave him a perplexed look. Why aren't you at work? I got the evening off, Derek responded as he punched in the number of the local pizza place that delivered. I'm ordering pizza. What do you guys want? Meat lovers, Dwayne immediately replied. Is it on you? Yep. Derek called to the living room. Hey, other guy, what do you want for pizza? I have a name. Nick, or Ned, responded. Hawaiian. Derek shrugged, asking Dwayne, what is his name? Dwayne laughed. You serious? He's been our roomie for the past eight months or so. That probably says something about me, Derek said wryly. I have no idea even what his name is. 
is Norbert. Everybody calls him Bert, Dwayne answered. I guess I was way off. Derek put in their orders, giving the address. What are you guys up to tonight? Video games? Dwayne grabbed an extra glass for Derek. Join us. Find out who we really are. Derek shrugged. He had nothing better to do. I have zero talent or practice at video games. Then we'll enjoy laughing long and hard at you, Dwayne said easily. That's pretty much my life anyways, Derek agreed as he followed Dwayne to the living room. Taking a seat on the couch, game to try and learn more about the two guys he'd been cohabitating with. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Sweet Valentine. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. You can also find Sweet Valentine and other books by Josephine Bintema on Amazon. These are available in paperback, ebook, and also on Kindle Unlimited. Happy reading!